Hello everyone and welcome back to The Brightworks. Today we're going to be taking a nice long look at every unit available to the Armada faction in Beyond All Reason. This is going to be a long video, but I will break it up into different parts based on the lab that each unit comes from. So if you're looking for details on a specific unit, be sure to just check the timestamps in the bottom to find which unit you're looking for uh, and which lab it comes out of. And then there will be an order that we follow from top left to bottom right for every lab. So if you're looking for a specific unit, once again, just find the, the section that we're talking about the lab that that unit comes from and then skip around until you find the unit that you're looking for information on. Otherwise, feel free to enjoy as we delve into every single unit that the Armada faction can use. So getting right into this, we are going to start with the T1 Bot Lab. T1 Bot Lab, probably the most common thing or the most common lab, I should say, that the Armada faction is going to play with. You'll see this, you know, nine times out of ten in any game with Armada commanders in it. So let's take a look at some of these units here. We're going to follow this trail until we get to the T1 units. And here we are. So following our pattern, we're going to start in the top left, move across the right, and then down until we get to the very bottom. So the first unit... First unit that we're going to be talking about today is the crossbow. Now I'm going to cover this for the T1 units and then it, it generalizes to all the other ones as well. So I'll cover it here and then I won't go into it again, but it's good to know that on each, any of these units, if you select the unit or you hover over it in the, the tab here, I'll select the bot lab and then I hover over it. You can see that it brings up a little card uh, with information in the bottom left hand corner. That card is actually very useful, and there's a lot of information there to gleam, um, like the range, DPS, all that sort of stuff. Uh, but there's a really important piece to that card that a lot of people might not know about. And that's going to be this little symbol in the bottom, or the, sorry, the top left-hand corner of the card. What that symbol denotes is exactly what purpose this unit is intended to fill in your army uh, based on you know, what, what its attacks are and uh, what it's specifically good against. So for the crossbow, we have a purple triangle. And what that means is that this unit can attack the air. Uh, in fact, it only attacks the air. It's an amphibious anti-air bot, as its description down here reads. Um, and indeed, it fires a missile that can track uh, air units and bring down light T1 aircraft. Um, this unit is specifically very good against light aircraft. So their scouting units, uh, Cortex Shuriken, um, and in enough numbers, these can also bring down bombers and fighters and that sort of thing. That's the role that they play. Uh, they are also amphibious, which means that they walk along the bottom of the ocean. So if you need to get them into somewhere, uh, you know, tricky to get to, you can move them around through lakes or, or uh, water, across rivers, wherever you need them to go. Now the next unit up is the Rocketeer. Now the Rocketeer has a different symbol. You can see it has a red plus sign or a red, uh, red cross sign. That means that this unit is a ground skirmisher unit. Um, so, you know, it, it's going to be a unit that you pull to your front lines and you use it to defend them and, and basically push back the enemy horde as it is. Um, and so you will see that symbol throughout and that's what that means. Now to get into the Rocketeer specifically, um, it is called a Rocketbot. And in fact, its name is technically Rocketbot Good versus Static Defense, which is uh, a funny but uh, if not true tip for everyone picking up the Rocketbot. Uh, it has a large attack range, um, larger than most other T1. In fact, larger than every other T1, I believe. Uh, a range of 475, and indeed it is very good against static defenses. So this is your siege unit, or at least one of the, the options you have as a siege unit uh, for T1 bots. Um, good for breaking down light laser, light laser turrets that your enemy might be spamming in the front lines. Um, but they quickly fall off as you move into heavy laser turrets or medium laser turrets or uh, any T2 defense. Next unit up is the Mace. The Mace is a T1 uh, skirmisher bot, uh, is what I would call it. Um, its name is a light plasma bot. Uh, and indeed, it lobs a, a plasma projectile uh, up into the air and uh, allows your, you know, it, it, sort, of, it sort of fires the, the plasma around, which if you're familiar with BAR, um, you'll know what a pl you know what plasma means in intrinsically, but for anyone who might be new, 
plasma refers to a a sort of lobbed projectile and in fact i'll force this guy to shoot at the ground here so you see what i mean you can see it sort of lobs out these these blobs of plasma um, anything with a plasma based attack is going to do something similar to that uh, now the the mace is a sort of heavy duty skirmishing bot it has a little bit more health than some of the other options um, it can shoot a little bit further. It's sort of the middle ground, but it does come at the cost of 130 metal. Um, so you have to be careful when you're using them. Definitely best to use them to push an area before capturing it with lighter units and reclaiming whatever you destroyed. Um, but definitely an effective one nonetheless. You just have to be careful and make sure that you're not spending all your metal. Uh, the next unit up is the Centurion. Uh, the Centurion is a medium infantry bot, and it's it's the fastest way to get to medium infantry in the game. Uh, it features two laser weapons, um, dual close quarters ground-to-ground -ground laser. And if I just force this to fire for just a second, you can see it shoots these uh, these two beams of, of laser uh, out from its hands. Uh, and indeed, this is a very effective weapon against early spam. Um, just a cut above the the early spam units which we'll get into here on this bottom row um namely these two here but uh it, it is it is what you're looking for if you're trying to stop a lot of spam and you need something cheap and quick um but not at the price point of t2 yet um so that's that's mainly what this guy is very useful for but he does also have a lot of health so if you need something at the front lines to soak a lot of damage as well that might be a good option there um for contesting like laser turrets or if they have artillery or something like that um might take a look at the Centurion. Now, the next thing to get into are the constructors. Um, there are two T1 constructors. The first one is the construction bot. And this is what you use to build all of your T1 infrastructure. Um, any of this stuff, you can check out details about in my other videos. Um, this isn't really the place for that. We're just looking at the units and what they can do. Um, but real quickly, I'll just show you all the different things that they can construct. And this is uh, this is the, the gateway to getting into the Tech 2 bots. Um, if you're if you're interested in teching upwards, you would use a tech one constructor um, of any of the different factories. But also, this is how you can construct the heavy laser turrets, the the medium laser turrets, some of the auxiliary, you know, uh, buildings that provide advantages, um, as well as your static defenses. Now, the next one up is the Lazarus, and this is a stealthy res repair reclaim bot. So that's a lot of buzzwords, but what do they mean? Well, stealthy means that it won't be detected by radar, which is important. Um, so if these guys are walking around, you know, wherever it is, they, uh, if they're within a radar field, they won't be detected. There won't be a little, a little blip on the radar where they are, um, which is important because it means that you can reclaim off of a battlefield where the enemy has radar presence. Um, and the artillery won't be able to sh shell away at you because the radar isn't pinging your Lazarus. Now, it is a res repair reclaim bot, so it means that it fills a lot of different uh, roles, but all of them are very useful. Resurrecting, of course, is where there are shells and husks of units that have been destroyed. You can tell this to resurrect using the resurrect button or the hotkey control R. Oops, control R? No, that's not right. Oh, I think I must have rebound this there's there's a default hotkey just hover over the resurrect button it should tell you um but anyway if you uh if you want to resurrect you can tell this unit to resurrect things and it will go over there and it will bring the units back to life at the cost of energy um and then they and then you know they can rejoin your army so that's very effective if you if you have some high quality units that you really don't want to be down um you need to bring them back you just use a bunch of these bots and go resurrect whatever it is uh, but it, it can also repair, which of course is sort of self-explanatory. You just hit R and it pulls up your little wrench and then you left click and drag and anywhere in this area, it will repair units that are damaged. Um, and lastly, it can reclaim, which is if you hit E, it pulls up your recycle menu and you can do the same thing as the repair where you left click and drag and anywhere inside the circle, it will reclaim things, uh, anything that's inside the circle. Now you'll notice it says metal and energy. That's because if you... Uh, have something to reclaim inside of the circle it will tell you how much metal and or how much energy you're going to get back from reclaiming that thing um, you will only get energy from trees and bushes and, and other organic stuff that you harvest uh, you'll get metal metal from wrecks and uh, rocks and stuff on the ground now moving along we have the pawn the pawn is an infamous unit uh, a lot of people love it and a lot of people hate it 
And a lot of people, you know, feel both ways, you know, depending on whether they're fighting them or, or not. Uh, but the pawn is the, the, the grunt unit of the Armada faction. Um, although I shouldn't, sh shouldn't say grunt because Cortex uh, grunt unit is literally called the grunt. Uh, but anyway, it fires a rapid fire plasma attack, um, as you can see. And it is a, it is a raiding bot. So what, what does that mean? It means it's very fast moving. Um, and it, you know, it has a speed of 84 relative to these, which have 46 or, uh, 51. So very fast, almost double the speed. Um, and so you can, you can send these around enemy defenses on big open flat maps. You can really send them around all over the place to, to flank and do that sort of thing. You can also use them to kite rocketeers and other, other rocket bots, because when you do that, uh, a lot of times they'll miss their shots because they're overcompensating for the speed of the unit. Uh, but this is your, your early game harassment unit. You can see it only costs 48 metal, um, and it is incredibly cheap to build and throw up, you know, 10, 15, 100 of these and use them to swarm your enemy very rapidly. Uh, ironically, you see them very early in the, in the, or you see them, well, almost immediately in the early game, probably the first unit you're going to build. And then they kind of go away after a time, replaced by T2 units. And then they make a resurgence in the late game where they will come back and you will see them in the thousands being pumped out of factories and sent to their doom to do one or two percent on you know enemy structures but you can mass produce them so effectively that uh it actually ends up working out um but anyway that's your that's your uh bread and butter your your default unit if you will uh for the armada t1 factory uh last but certainly not least is the tick and this is a fun little unit it's a you can see it's a little bug thing on the ground uh with this you know kind of weird little head um, it has a little laser attack that it shoots out of its nose just an absolutely adorable unit and you can see it kind of skitters along the ground and it is lightning quick so if we you know we move it around here you can see these things move super fast relative to all the other units incredibly incredibly fast especially for a t1 unit now how do you use the tick right because it's sort of like a it, it, extremely cheap e extremely economical uh unit but w what's its role well there's a few things that it kind of fits into um, one of them is, is a scouting unit, um, which its name would imply, Fast Scout Bot. Um, because it does have a large vision radius. In fact, if we bring it over here, you can see this sort of circle that's outlined here as its vision radius, which is actually a lot larger than most other units. So it is good for taking a look around the map, um, because you can produce so so many of them so cheaply. Uh, and, you know, just, just scout where your enemies are at. Um, but because of their speed, they're also very, very good for harassing enemy metal extractors so you can put one right here between two metal extractors and it'll tilt its head and start firing at them and it'll take a while or, well not a while but it'll take multiple shots in order to bring down these metal extractors but you, for the for the cost of 15 metal you've essentially denied your enemy say four metal per second for 30 seconds or however long it takes them to rebuild those metal extractors so it's a very easy way to deal a lot of early game damage to your enemy's economy and give yourself a nice early lead over them uh, without giving up too much metal. Uh, I would recommend if you're an Armada commander and you're playing on a, a map and you're not, you know, Navy or Air or, or some other strategy, if you're going bots, I would recommend you just build three of these right off the gate and send them straight across the map. Just clear across, rally them over there so that as soon as they come out of the bot lab, they just head that direction. Um, that's, that's my tip to you because you're, you're so likely to do some sort of effective damage with these, um, trade them out cost efficiently, that it's almost always worth it to send them across, um, in every game that you're Armada. Now that concludes the T1 bots. So I, uh, if you have any questions about them, of course, you know, feel free to leave them in the comments, but now we're going to zoom back out. We're going to go back here and we're going to look at the next lab up. So this is the next section. We're going to be talking about the T2 bot lab. So if we follow our trail back this way, we've already seen them in a glimpse here. But we have two different tabs of these T2 bots. Uh, this is the, the second tab here. This group right here is the second tab. Second tab. Uh, and this is the first. So we're just going to start with the first and then we'll go on to the second. Uh, so first up is the hound. This is a common unit. This is this is your this is your bread and butter T2. Um, if not the welder, if not the sprinter, if not the sniper, 
Um, and I say all that because you're going to want to use a big combination of these units to really be effective. But the Hound might be the first one you always produce first. Uh, it has a big artillery shot that it shoots. Boom. That's a plasma. Um, you'll remember that from the, the other uh, bots in T1. Um, but it can also switch weapon attacks. So it can switch from heavy plasma to gauss cannon, which you can see is a much quicker projectile. You saw how much quicker that shot. Let it shoot one more time and then it'll switch it. So just for comparison, this is get, this is plasma. You can see that sort of lobbed shot that it does versus the gauss cannon. So you can see it's a lot quicker. So what does that mean? Well, it means that this unit can serve sort of two different roles. Uh, when you have it in plasma mode, it can lob the shot a little bit further um, and it does a little bit more AOE damage. So what that means it's a is it's a really good siege weapon. Um, you can use it to tear down turrets. You can use it against uh, uh, porcupine T1 units that are just holding a position. Um, all that, all that sort of stuff. It's very good for. Um, now, if you if you have fast light units that are pushing into you, and all you have are hounds, you can switch them to the Gauss version. And what it means that it's gonna that its projectile travels faster is that they're a little less likely to overcorrect when they're firing at the units. So you're more likely to hit with the Gauss cannons, meaning that, of course, you're going to be more likely to put out more damage before the enemy gets to you, which is good for you for obvious reasons. So that's the, the decision-making behind switching between your two modes, and it is good to know that those modes exist. I think a lot of players don't realize that because it's just another tab that's down here in the, the bottom with this huge panel of controls. Um, but, but that's definitely something to keep, keep your eye on and be aware of when you're playing with hounds. And I would definitely recommend them. They're, they just, they're, they do a tremendous amount of damage. If you mass them, they're, they're going to be effective. They have a relatively high speed, um, and a huge attack range. There's just, you know, a lot to love about this unit. So that's everything about the hounds that you need to know. Um, hopefully now the next unit up is the sharpshooter, which is a sniper bot. This is an interesting one. Um, I have, I personally have a love-hate relationship with this bot. I find that a lot of the times um, I lose these because of horrible positioning on my my part, um, and other times I feel like I lose them because of uh, you know inconsistencies in the way that they act. But the way that they act to to get into that part of it is they fire a single shot every you know every every so often. Um, and then they have to recharge after a long time. So I'll have it shoot at this tree here, and I'll show you exactly what I mean. Oh, I guess I have to tell it to shoot a little further. And there you go. So you can see now it has to recharge for quite a while uh, before it will take its next shot. But that being said, this shot is insanely powerful. Stupidly powerful. It, it, it's able to almost instantly kill... Uh, well, it, it will instantly kill almost all T2 units, short of maybe some of the bulkier ones like the Fat Boy um, for Armada, and, you know, some of the some of the really strong ones, um, and essentially just wipe it off the face of the map. Uh, aside from that, of course, it has a huge attack radius. You can see it can attack this entire area over here, um, which is just tremendous. So, as a as a as a siege weapon. It, it's not really the role that it fills because it, it, it doesn't really fire as consistently as you'd want it to be firing for a siege weapon. It sort of fills this role where you have a T2 economy and T2 units, but your enemy is in this position where they're going up towards T3 and they already have a few T3 units out and you need some way to, to, to destroy those T3 units um, so that they don't you know come wreck your base. The sharpshooter fills that role perfectly because... It does one shot of extremely high damage, uh, and then it has to recharge for a while. So if you build two or three of these, they'll be able to burst down any early T3 units that, that are just sort of alone um, and prevent them from, from causing too much mayhem. Uh, that being said, they are effective to bring to the front lines because they will destroy any, any defenses that are set up very quickly. Uh, you just have to know that they're extremely slow, so you can't really retreat with them quickly if your enemy swarms you with fiends or... Uh, you know, any sort of fast light unit. Um, but anyway, that's that's sort of the role that the marksmen, or the, the, I always call them marksmen, but they're, they're sharpshooters. Um, that's the role that they play. 
one big shot and then they have to take a break for a while. Uh, moving along, we have the Archangel. Uh, this is a advanced amphibious anti-air bot. So very similar to the crossbow, uh, which we saw just previously in the T1s. Uh, it is a anti-air bot and it is amphibious. So it can walk along the bottom of the, the ocean. Uh, but what does it do? Well, it fires a, a whole array of anti-air options. Um, here you can see the, the whole list of all of them. But basically it fires four missiles um, and then also has a flat cannon that it fires every so often on a, on a cooldown. Um, just a, 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 essentially just a better version of that T1 uh, anti-air bot. However, I will say that its price, you know, for $520, um, well, 520 metal, I should say, it is a relatively bad option for anti-air. Um, I don't use these unless there's really an area that I need anti-air in that I just can't get a builder to. Um, the, the most common example of that, of course, would be the front line. You know, you, sometimes you just lose your builder up there and you can't really keep an anti-air uh, line up there. Uh, that, that, that might be an, a reasonable use for these. Just put one or two of them up there. Uh, but they, they, the problem with these, the problem that I have with these is that they fire four missiles in a big burst, but the missiles will often track one target and the first two missiles will usually kill it if it's T1 or the first three will kill it if it's T2. So that's kind of the, like it'll, it'll it, essentially it always overkills whatever it's shooting at. Um, the flak also doesn't fire very often, so it, it's not like a great anti-swarm uh mechanic so i don't know I, I i don't really have any good feelings about this i would much rather just build a bunch of t1 or t2 anti-air uh wherever wherever i need it but uh it, it does have its use and occasionally i'll pop them out if i need to uh, lend anti-air to a ally who doesn't have any years rebuilding or something like that now moving along we have the fat boy um, this is a hilarious unit. You can see it has these massive feet and it stomps around on them. Um, I absolutely love this unit. I just, I think it's hilarious. Uh, that being said, I don't use it very often because it kind of has a specific use case that I don't, I try to avoid getting into. Um, that being where you're up T2, you don't have a great economy and you need to deal with a enemy who is swarming you with T1 units. Now, the reason this fills that role so well is because it bombards them with a huge plasma shot. Now I'm in the targeting scope here and you can see the AOE of the shot that it lobs. And when I fire it here, you'll see exactly it's, it's not joking around. Oof, that here, huge, huge shot. Um, and then it has to cool down for a minute before firing another one. Absolutely devastating and will one shot, um, any T1 units that are inside there, um, at the very least any, any light T1 units, uh, two shotting or sometimes even one shotting. Uh, even some of the stronger units. Um, but this does come at the cost of 1400 metal. So you're, you're really investing a lot into one unit that's lobbing one projectile every, you know, five or six seconds. So you, you kind of have to use these sparingly. You have to use them in conjunction with other units. They're a great way to eliminate a whole swath of T1 units, or at least cut them down really quickly. Um, but they're going to get overrun if, if it doesn't wipe them out entirely. So you have to mix them with other units. Now, uh, these two units, the next ones that we're going to get into, are the Radar and Radar Jammer. And they're sort of two sides of the same coin, so we'll cover them together. Uh, the Radar Bot is just a portable radar. So all the benefits that you get out of a regular radar tower, the vision and the radar range, you get those out of this bot as well, um, except that it's mobile. So that's, you know, that's the, the benefit of it. Um, it's extremely weak, and if it's damaged, it won't function properly. And the the uh, spin-off side of this is the Radar Jammer bot. So this functions exactly the same as a Radar Jammer, except instead of um, you know being rooted in place and can camouflage, it is just a mobile version of a Radar Jammer. Uh, this also will stop functioning if it becomes damaged, and you'll need to replace it, because currently there's a bug that will turn them off, and they won't be able to turn back on uh, once they're damaged. So... If you're, if you're planning on using these, you sort of need a constant stream of these, or at least need to be aware of the fact that if they're damaged for some reason, they won't be able to turn back on. Um, that's not a feature. I, I believe that's a bug, but it, you know, it's, it's something to be, be aware of anyway. Um, now, moving on, we have the welder. Now, the welder might be my favorite unit. Uh, it, it's just such a cool design, and it's got a, it's, it's got a really cool um, look to it, and it fills a really great purpose. 
the welder is a lightning unit. Um, the first lightning unit we've seen, I think. And what that means is that it shoots this arc of lightning, this, this bolt of lightning that jumps around and attacks anything nearby it. Um, what that means is that this is a very, very good unit against T1 spam because it will do a huge amount of damage to the first unit it hits and then a, a decent amount of damage to the next two that it hits and then, you know, a, few, a little bit more damage to the others. So if you have four or five of these in a line, they can almost indefinitely hold off a swarm of T1 units just because of how efficient their attack is against T1 that's all clumped up. Um, that being said, they're relatively slow, so you do need to be preemptive with them. But I would say, if you're looking for a counter to Fiends, which are the T2 Cortex uh, Flamethrower units, this might be one of your best options. But you have to be aware of the fact that they're way slower than the Fiends, so you need to have them in the positions where they would defend against the Fiends before the Fiends are out. So the the advice I give is once you get to T2, once you get a T2 Constructor out, you start upgrading your Metal Extractors, think about making Welders and Hounds. That's sort of the, the, the best combination, because the Welders will basically push all the, the first couple of units back, while the Hounds are shooting over the Welders and laying... You know, putting enough damage into the other stuff that the welders can kill them pretty easily. They're a great dream team, and it's something to be very well aware of. Now, up next is a unit that is, well, interesting. Let's let's say interesting. Uh, this is the Gunslinger, and uh, in my mind, this unit is like a cowboy. Um, but I've never taken a good look up close to it, and it's got kind of an interesting look to it. Uh, the cow the the cowboy Gunslinger skirmish bot has a. You'll notice it says fast learning auto repair. It has twin Gauss cannons that it fires, sort of out of its hands. And these Gauss cannons have a little bit of impulse, I think is the term for that. Um, but what I mean is that it will slow enemies down when it hits them. Um, which is interesting, because it means that this is actually a really good option for dealing with T1 spam units. Because it will shoot them, and they'll slow down, and then they'll block all the other units around them. Uh, so, for, for kind of a weird reason, it actually ends up being really good against T1 units. Um, but the, the really interesting quirks about this unit are that it, it is fast learning and it has auto repair. So the auto repair is sort of self-explanatory. It just means that it heals over time when it takes damage, um, which is super useful, right? Cause you can use this thing. You can go poke enemy lines. You can, you can use it to defend. You can use it for whatever purpose you need it. Um, and then if you, as long as it survives, you can pull it off the front line and in a, you know, a couple seconds, it'll be repaired all the way back to normal. Um, and then you can go put it into combat again. The fast learning works perfectly for that because what that means is that it uses it whenever it attacks things, it gains XP uh, slightly, you know, at a, at a slightly increased rate compared to all the other units. So in case you weren't aware, there is a veterancy system in this game. Uh, all units can use it, um, and whenever they attack a unit or a structure or anything like that, they gain veterancy. Veterancy increases things like their damage per second their health their total health um things like that uh and it's you know it's kind of a cool system the gunslinger just takes advantage of that more so so if as the, the more fights you can get it into the uh the more you can the more you the, the better they get and the more the more fights you can put it into in the future i always think of these guys like cowboys um you know just just uh sharpshooters uh quick hands that get into duels fastest hands in the west and then you know whichever one survives that's the strongest one right anyway moving on we have the t2 constructor so uh very similar of course to the t1 constructor that was in the the other batch uh this allows you to step into t3 if you want to go up to that or it allows you to build all the t2 uh, uh facilities all that sort of stuff uh defenses very very useful it allows you to build these t2 auxiliary structures like the plasma deflector and the pinpointers um all that all that really good stuff uh, anti-nuke very important all that is uh covered by your t2 constructor uh, likewise the armada faction has the butler which is the t2 assist bot uh, this is kind of interesting because there's a there's a, a discon discontinuity or discongruity, I guess I would say, uh, between Cortex and Armada. The Cortex T2 helper bot is a lot better than the Armada T2 helper bot. Um, you can see all the things that the T2 Armada helper bot can build. Um, you have a, a radar and 
uh, radar jammer bot that it can construct on the field. Uh, it can also put up these little cameras, solar panels, windmills, uh, metal extractors, and energy converters, and that's it. But it does have 140 build power, so it is a really good option for uh, portable build power. Almost, you know, almost as much as the T2 constructor, right? So it is a very, very helpful little bot to build a couple of these and send them out, and they'll be able to th throw things up really quickly. Um, they just can't build very much on their own. Um, but you just have to be aware of that, right? And then it, it's not so big a problem. Uh, the next bot up is the Sprinter. Uh, the Sprinter is your your first technically defined raider bot although i would i would probably classify the uh the tick under the raider bot as well but uh the raider bot is called that because it's able to run around extremely fast so you can see exactly how quickly this guy can move um much quicker than any of the other bots and uh that's that's a huge advantage for if you're trying to run past enemy defenses of course um and it also has a plasma uh fast shooting plasma gun see it's got a little little rifle there uh, and it shoots this kind of stream of plasma bullets, and that's uh, that's that's great for exactly the purpose that it's defined for, which is to run past enemy defenses, get into their base or metal extractor zones or wherever it is, and destroy those really quickly, um, and then move along. Uh, if you're if you're looking for an option to run past enemy defenses or to to do a perform a flank or something like that, uh, the Raider bot is definitely what you're looking for. And the last bot. A complex bot to use, um, but simple at first glance, is the Ghost. Uh, this is the spy bot, and both factions have this available. Uh, the, the Ghost is a uh, cloaked unit, which means that it can't be seen with, you know, if they have line of sight on the area. Um, it also cannot be uh, targeted by radar. You can see radar invisible spy bot. Um, and then it is... It is uh, a, well, it's a spy, so it means it has a huge line of sight. You can see these, this sort of white line creeping around on the mountain. That's the line of sight for this bot, um, and you can see it's actually really huge. Uh, this bot is sort of what you would use in conjunction with sharpshooters or hounds uh, in order to make sure that you have accurate line of sight data about where your enemy is exactly. Um, and so to that effect, it's extremely useful for, for sneaking up to your enemy defenses, and then uh, you know you have that line of sight. But there is another use for these bots that's a little bit lesser known, but extremely useful. When you self-destruct this bot, it will emit an EMP blast in this blue circle and stun everything around it. So what you can do is if you manage to get this up to an enemy's base, let's pretend for a second that all these units here are enemy units. You hit control and then you hit D, it will start the countdown and explode paralyzing all of these units for 21 seconds which is huge that's a tremendous amount of time so if you can coordinate a few of these on the enemy front line get them all to self-destruct and paralyze the enemy units it's more than enough time to move yours in and deliver the final final blow on that enemy army now you do have to keep in mind though as soon as you self-destruct it you do lose that line of sight so you, you have to be careful not to uh, destroy all of them, or at the very least have a backup prepared. That is if you're relying on that line of sight in order to attack whatever you paralyze. Anyway, moving on to the second page here. The first uh, unit that we have up is the platypus. Um, the platypus is this cute little walking unit um, with a laser attack. But the interesting part about the platypus is that it is also... Amphibious, although amphibious is a slightly different term, um, or at least slightly works slightly differently with the platypus. You can see it actually floats on top of the water rather than walking underneath. Um, sort of cute when it's folded up like this, but yeah, they, they, can, they can only float on top of the water, so they don't walk underneath. That being said, they can still attack while they're on top of the water, which is pretty handy. Um, and it's definitely a good option if you're looking for a way to harass an enemy that is playing with boats. Um, out in the water. So I just noticed that there's penguins on this map. That's interesting. Not a unit you can build, or I guess a unit that you can enjoy uh, for for both factions, but interesting nonetheless. Anyways, the next unit up is the Umbrella. This is the mobile anti-nuke for Armada. Uh, Cortex has one of these as well, but it's not their bot lab. It's actually their vehicle lab. You can see this has a really cool insectoid design, and you can see on the back there is a Citadel, which is actually the Armada anti-nuke. Um, this is a crucial unit for Armada. This is, you, you need to be aware of this unit and, and when you need to use it. 
Uh, this unit is is a all terrain unit, which means it can climb up any any cliff, any surface, um, and park itself there. And then you can see this big yellow circle. That's where the unit is providing its anti nuke field. So if a nuke is launched from an enemy and they've clicked the attack option anywhere inside of this yellow circle, this anti nuke will go off and it will shoot a missile up and destroy their nuclear missile. So it's really important to know about this. It's really important to know it. Um, and this is one of those special symbols that, that I talked about earlier, um, the anti-nuke symbol. Uh, you'll see that occasionally, but only on you know a few buildings and, and vehicles, and this is one of them. So anyway, moving along, uh, we have the decoy commander. This is an interesting unit. I don't see these built very often. Um, sort of an odd choice for like strategics uh but but the, i guess they do serve a purpose you can do almost everything that you can normally do with a commander um except you can't build like any any sort of production structures so you can build like wind farms and solar you can build tidal generators um you can build uh, uh radar towers um but you can you see you can also build these landmines which is sometimes useful um you can cloak with the commander as well I believe uh, yeah, here we go. So you can cloak it, um, and then it also has a D gun. Except the D gun is uh, it's fake; <laughs> it doesn't actually do very much damage. Um, so it's interesting because you can sort of like spook someone by by D gunning towards them, and you know they'll they'll keep their units away from the the fake commander. Uh, but if they you know the second that they actually get D gun, they get hit with your your D gun, they're gonna be like, oh, that's a decoy. That's odd. I you know you don't run into many people building these, but. I guess it's good to know that it's there. Um, I can't really offer you any advice, any words of warning about uh, what you should use this for. Uh, you'll have to be creative with that because I, I just genuinely do not use them. Uh, moving along, the next unit up I do use quite a lot. They're called the Weber, um, and they're an all-terrain EMP and reclaiming spider. A lot there, but we'll break it down. Um, if I show you their attack, you can see it's a little EMP burst. It's this little turret on its head wraps around and it shoots a little blast of EMP. Um, if we actually get this to target a friendly unit, let's see if we can convince it to. Uh, it looks like it won't. Well, it will stun anything that it attacks. It, it, uh, it paralyzes them. The other thing is that this can actually uh, reclaim stuff. So if you hit E, you enter your, your reclaim mode, um, which normally only constructors can use, like the construction turret or the butler or the, the res bot or anything like that. Um, but this one can actually reclaim stuff. So the way I typically use these is when I'm at a lead and I need to reclaim a bunch of metal on the front lines, I'll use my T2 bot lab and produce maybe 20 of these, um, depending on how much metal I have available, but I'll produce, uh, you know, 20 or so of these. They're relatively cheap, 250 metal for, for a T2 unit. That's not bad. Um, and then I will just attack move with them, which is F for me, the, the fight order. Um, and then I will I will click somewhere in the battlefield. And so you see it just travels along this line, this purple line. But when you give it that attack or that that command, any scrap metal that it comes across, any wrecks that it finds on its way to that purple marker, it will stop and it will eat them up. Um, so I will I will usually take these and I'll zoom out and then I'll I'll have a bunch of them, but I'll I'll put them all in a big fan. And that way any amount of metal that they encounter while they're out there, you know, walking around. Uh, they're gonna they're gonna bring it back to me um, yeah so that, I, I think that basically covers the use case for the Weber it is all terrain which of course means that it can move up and down any surface very similar to the anti nuke and the next one that we're gonna cover um, and and yeah you consider using them if there's a lot of metal on the field that you want to grab uh, but you're not sure like what unit you should be doing you know and you don't want to just send defenseless res bots out there um, consider the Weber for, for that purpose next up we have the recluse sort of the big daddy uh, you know one step above the Weber um, this is an attack unit, and it fires rockets. It's a rocket spider. Um, and you can see it fires this salvo of three rockets. Very cool. Uh, and it is it is an interesting siege unit, I would say. It, it, it does have a huge range, so it's very good for taking out turrets and other emplacements like that. Um, but it's also anti... Uh, or Sorry, not anti. It's all-terrain, which is probably its biggest benefit. Um, which basically means that it can climb any surface that you want. Uh, maybe I'll demonstrate that have it climb up this hill here uh, but yeah these units are good if there's weird terrain on a map that you need to bypass in order to attack your enemy uh, they can often be used as a surprise tactic to attack enemies where they don't have defenses 
Um, you know, they thought they were secured because there was a mountain right there, and it turns out you have a bunch of spiders that just crawled over it. So that's a really interesting option. can lead to some interesting tactical decisions, um, and I love to see it. I, I always think these uh, provide some sort of interesting gameplay. Um, and yeah, you can see this made it up to the top here, no, no problem. can rain terror down on these penguins and trees and whatever else. Uh, but yeah, that's that's kind of the use case for this this spider is, you know, when you have an enemy that's in a specific area that you can't really reach because of terrain features, you just throw a bunch of these together and then you can have them walk over the terrain. Easy as pie. Next up, we have the tumbleweed. This is an interesting one. It's an amphibious rolling bomb. Um, and you can see it doesn't feet, in fact, just roll around uh, wherever it needs to go. Um, this is a suicide unit. So it just gets to where you, you want to take it, and then it explodes. Uh, it does have kind of an interesting little set of eyes there. I never noticed that. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're kind of an interesting option. They don't cloak or anything, so if your enemy sees them, they're just going to shoot them and blow them up. So they're not extremely useful as a, uh, a frontline sort of, sort of uh, unit, per se. They're, they're definitely more of like a... A sneaky harassment unit you know on, on a map like this you might send them into the water and then have them go about and 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 pop up somewhere else where the enemy isn't expecting it and then blow up part of their base like that um, that being said and a note to keep in mind for any suicide units that you might use because there are a few for cortex if you just attack move with these you just hit f and go like that and it detects an enemy it will explode and do a little bit of damage but if you actually hit control D, it will explode in a huge radius, like way, way bigger, much, much bigger explosion. Uh, so if you are using these, I would recommend instead of spamming them, I would recommend making a few of them and trying to micro them as precisely as you can until you crash them into an enemy um, and you, you know, you, you explode them. Uh, I should have said before I detonated that, but there's this option for fire at will. You can toggle that to hold fire, and if you do that, they won't explode prematurely, and you can decide when they'll detonate, and that, that can be a lot more effective. Anyway, that's the end of the T2 bots, so we're going to take this trail back, and we'll start our next section. So, next up, I know it's been a long one, but we're just going to keep chugging through, keep powering through this. Hopefully, this is cumulative enough that uh, it answers anybody who plays Armada's questions. Uh, next up is the vehicle plant, so we'll follow this trail down this way. This is all the vehicles that you have available to you. Now, uh, we're going to start in this left corner, but we're going to cheat a little because we're also going to talk about this uh, construction bot just to save you a little bit of the time. Uh, both of these do the same thing. They're just your T1 constructor, same as the constructor bot, and there's not really a lot to say. This is just your bridge to Tech 2 vehicles as opposed to Tech 2 bots. Um, and that's really all you need to know about them uh, that, that's different than any other Tech 1 constructor. Now, this one, however, the Beaver is a constructor vehicle for a uh, uh, underwater and above water surfaces. So there's a, you know there's there's some interesting applications for that if you need to build metal extractors out in the ocean or something like that, but you're on vehicle tech, you can build a beaver and you can uh, you can you can uh, start using your your uh, land advantage into the water power. Uh, now moving on, we do have the amphibious light tank, the pincer. Um, this is a great unit to spam if you've secured a naval advantage and you need to press land um, and you know start start attacking land. Uh, but but all you have is is naval. Uh, what I would recommend you build is a amphibious naval construction yard, uh, which you can build with these amphibious uh, vehicles here the amphibious complex. Uh, and you can build the amphibious complex to build any of the, uh, any of the amphibious units here that I've gone over. Um, but you can, you can build this in the water so that you can build these underwater tanks, send them underwater and then pop them up on the beach or whatever and storm the beaches, you know, real Normandy style on your enemy. And then uh, you have a nice advantage where, where you've popped up out of nowhere with a hundred tanks and they're all light tanks. So they're relatively cheap to produce. Um, yeah, that's that's kind of the use case for these. It's they're, they're how you go from having a naval, naval supremacy to having a land-based supremacy. Next up is the Whistler, a missile truck. Um, there are variants of this for both the Cortex and the Armada, but the important part is that this is sort of like a low-damage, long-range siege unit. So you build these to harass uh, 
light laser towers or very light units like spam units, um, ticks, grunts, pawns, that sort of thing. Um, it has a huge range and it sends out these these like light missiles. Uh, very 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 light missiles, but they you know they they can be very effective at a long range and they also track. So you know that as soon as it fires, it's going to hit something. Uh, I would recommend this as like a siege option um, if you're if you're looking for sort of a committed long time long term siege option. Um, but there is other siege options, namely this one right here, but we'll get into that in just a second. Next up is the Stout. This is your bread and butter vehicle for Armada. This is the T1 tank. Uh, it fires a plasma projectile in a nice little, nice little radius at a pretty consistent speed. Um, this is a great unit overall. It has high health. It has decent DPS for its tech level. Um, definitely, you know, a, a frontline unit that you use to, to swarm your enemy with and uh, push them back. You just want to make sure that you accompany this this grouping of units with reclaim bots or uh, or construction vehicles, so that you have a way to reclaim all this metal that's tied up in the stout. Because you can see it is 225 metal a piece. Uh, moving along, we have the Janus. Uh, Janus is a interesting one. It's a rocket launcher unit, and it fires two rockets at its target location. And these are heat seeking rockets. They explode, doing huge area damage. Um, and then the Janus has to recharge for a little while. This is your anti-swarm unit. So if you have a uh, person going T1 bots and they're producing a ton of T1 bots and you need a, an answer for it, the Janus is probably your best bet. It, uh, it, it can dispatch T1 units in one shot um, at the cost of having a, a fairly lengthy cooldown and being relatively slow. Uh, next up is your Shell Shocker. This is an artillery vehicle. You can see it has a pretty, pretty huge range. Um, and you can see it's also fairly inaccurate. But you can tell it to shoot and then it puts its little barrel up and fires this this projectile, absolutely lobs it into the air, um, and then it comes down relatively close to where you're telling it to fire at. Uh, this is the most common way of sieging uh, light laser turrets and other, other emplacements that you need to get rid of. Uh, the Whistler is another good option, but it does less damage over time, so uh, the, the Shell Shocker is relatively more common, but they sort of fit the same role, so you might consider either one of them for uh, some sort of siege role. Uh, next up, we have the Groundhog. Uh, this is an interesting one. This is a Minesweeper slash Mine Layer. Uh, so anywhere inside of its little radius, it is radar jammed, which is kind of interesting. Um, but it's also stealthy, so it can't be seen on radar, uh, which is nice. It seems a little redundant to do that. I don't know why it does that. But I guess it's so that when you're building mines and stuff, they don't appear on the, they don't appear on the uh, radar when you're building them. That's my guess anyway, but... These can build light mines, medium mines, and heavy mines, as well as uh, perimeter cameras and uh, fortification walls. Uh, these are used for mine laying. That's, that's, I mean, that's their main purpose, right? You take this over here, and you tell it to lay a string of these light mines. It will come over here, and it will start building them one after another, just like that. Um, and these mines will cloak after a little while. And, uh, you know, I guess I should show you these because these are technically, I mean, they're not a unit, but they are something to know about for the Armada faction. Uh, you have light, medium, and heavy mines, of course, just corresponding to the amount of damage that they do to different units. Um, but if we bring this guy back over here, we can just detonate some of these. Oh, all right. Well, I caught it in the blast, but you can see they uh, they, they explode for a nice little chunk of damage. And they will they will damage any enemy units that trespass on them. I mean, they're a landmine. It's, it's obvious. Next up is the Blitz. Uh, the Blitz is the Blitz is your your sort of assault tank, your your raider vehicle, if you will. Um, and you can see this thing moves pretty quickly, um, and it has these these twin uh, assault cannons on them, which fire this blast that's almost identical to the pawn's attack, um, but just you know it's treaded and and it's a vehicle, so it has a little bit more health. Uh, all the same uses that go for the pawn: raiding, sneaking past enemy defenses, or just being a, a light unit that you can harass artillery with. All that sort of stuff. Perfect uh, fit for the Blitz. The final unit for T1 vehicles is the Rover. Now, the Rover is a uh, light scout vehicle with a huge line of sight radius. Um, very very comparable to the Tick. And you, you want to send, same as the Tick, which, I, which you know, if you're skipping around, I'll repeat myself. Uh, but the Tick uh, and the Rover, you, you, if you're playing Armada, you basically want to send out excuse me, at least three of them at the start of the game um, and just send them towards your enemy. That way, at the very least, you scout where your enemy is at, at a very relatively minimal cost to yourself. 
Um, and, you know, best case scenario, you can use them to destroy their mexes, get into their base, cause a lot of havoc and mayhem for them. Um, you know, tax their APM as much as you can in the early game, force them to slip up, and hopefully you're uh, you're the, all the better for it. Uh, but that's going to be the end of the T1 vehicles, so we'll take a step back. Uh, the next section that we're going to talk about is the Tier 2 vehicles. Um, that's, you know, that's where we're headed next. That's probably about halfway through this this uh, long, comprehensive guide. Um, but we'll we'll pick up the pace here and we'll keep keep chugging along. So the first vehicle that we're looking at is the Lightning Tank Jaguar. This is a raiding vehicle, which by now you're probably familiar with the term. Um, but raiding is basically for, you know, vehicles that are fast and have a, a high attack damage, um, but relatively low health. Uh, it has a lightning attack. And it also has a light uh, air-to-ground attack, so it shoots a missile up into the air. And it can take down T1 fighters and, uh, and scout craft, all that sort of stuff. Uh, this one is very, very good. This is a really good option for uh, dealing with T1 spam units. I would, I would definitely recommend if you're looking for a solution to that kind of thing. Um, also a good unit if you're looking for a solution to T T1 uh, air spam units, uh, because it does have that anti-air attack as well. Next unit up is the Turtle. This is a heavy amphibious tank. Uh, I love the design of this. I think, I mean, Turtle is just right. Like they probably came up with the design for this before they came up with the, you know, the, the, the rather they came up with the name for this before they came up with the design, right? They were like, oh, let's make a turtle based unit. Anyway, um, it has this big pop-up plasma cannon that it shoots. Oof, nice, nice big cannon. Um, these do a ton of damage and they're, a, they're a great option for if you're looking for something a little bit heavier to harass from the, from the ocean with, uh, you can build these at the amphibious complex and you can send them to land and they're just a even tougher version of the light amphibious tank. Uh, all the same rules apply. They're, they're great for turning a naval victory into a land-based victory. Next up is the anti-aircraft. Uh, this one is very self-explanatory, pretty short explanation, but it basically is a flat cannon on wheels, shoots down T1 aircraft, um, almost instantly and it'll take down t2 aircraft very quickly uh, after that we have the ambassador which is a stealthy rocket launcher so stealthy you might recognize of course meaning that it cannot be detected by radar but it has this huge aoe i mean wow what a huge radius of this just massive absolutely massive you can harass forever and ever with these um definitely a siege unit right you put this you put this somewhere far away from the enemy uh, lines and it can still hit them uh, you build these as a siege unit, and they launch this nice big missile. Uh, you know, big missile silo pops up. Absolutely love the design of that. And it shoots this big old rocket that flies up into the air, arcs all the way down, and comes down to collide with the ground. Um, definitely an awesome unit. Has a nice long cooldown, but that's you know that's that's fair for its damage output that it can it can deal. Uh, I would I would recommend these if you're looking to siege something, and you know they're really entrenched in a in some place, and you need a bunch of missile launchers to siege defenses. That's definitely the role that this thing fills. Uh, radar and radar jammer, very self-explanatory, just like all the other radar and radar jammer vehicles that we've, or vehicles, bots, whatever else that we've seen. Um, just a mobile radar and a mobile radar jammer. That's that's really all they do. Uh, I will note that the radar jammer is a little bit wider, uh, sli slightly larger area, um, as well as the the radar uh, having a slightly increased line of sight, basically just to correspond with its cost and and uh, the, you know the fact that it's all vehicles. Um, now we go into the T2 constructor. This is uh, virtually the same as the T2 bot constructor. It's just all your, your T2 vehicles, and, uh, or rather all your T2 v uh, facilities, um, as well as if you want to step into T3, this can do that as well. Uh, we're we're going to leave that be because that's, you know, that's pretty self-explanatory and any of the other ones will work. Um, now the really interesting one is the T2 vehicle assistant. This is comparable to the T2 Cortex bot assistant um and the in the fact that it's a quote-unquote combat engineer um so what that means is it has a huge range of different things that it can build uh construction turrets probably being one of the most useful as well as all of these t2 units you can build hounds recluses um you can build destroyers these are t1 all these ones here but uh you can build you can build the, the these air vehicles um or rather these uh these ocean vehicles you can build these amphibious vehicles you can build gunslingers that's another t2 unit um you can build these t2 anti-air defenses as well as these t2 uh ground defenses t2 radar and jammer just a whole host of, of really useful stuff um, these things can build so i would definitely recommend pumping a few of these things out uh, at the very least just to help your t2 constructors out because they also have 150 build power 
Um, but otherwise, you know, they're very useful on their own and they can, they can take on the role of a T1 constructor, but also be even more useful than that. Moving along, we have the bull. Um, this is another very, very common, uh, T2 vehicle for Armada. It costs 950 metal, which is tremendous. I mean, if you don't have a good economy, you're producing one or two of these every minute. Like they're, they're very, very, very expensive. But for good reason, they fire this huge plasma shot that does a tremendous amount of AOE damage. These are meant to decimate T1 forces. If you have a bunch of clumped up T1 bots, it's going to tear through them like butter. Absolutely eviscerate them. Uh, and that's, you know, that's, that's uh, correspondent to its cost, right? Like you pay a huge cost for this thing, but you get a huge, uh, huge amount of value out of it. Uh, it has a tremendous amount of health as well. So you can really use these things to smash through T1 uh anything really um with basically no problem these are a tiebreaker unit um now i'm realizing i just skipped two units so we'll just jump back and cover them right now sorry that's that's that might confuse somebody who's jumping around uh anyway we're, we're gonna go to the starlight uh this is the mobile tachyon weapon this is a siege weapon um but it is weird because it's a it's a laser weapon sustained laser weapon um, this kind of thing pops up in armada there's a, a few weapons that are like this but you can see if i fire it it shoots this beam uh, these are your vehicle equivalent to the marksman. Very good for bursting down really high health units, either whether they're T3 or just some of the tankier Cortex units that are T2. Uh, this is a great option. This this beam that it fires does a ton of damage, uh, but the, the trade-off is that they have to be facing the right direction for one. Um, so I can't just tell it to shoot behind it now. It's the, the turret won't rotate. It has to swivel its whole body. The turret has a little bit of rotate, but it, you know, it has to be facing like sort of 180 degrees in the right direction um more or less uh but what that means is that you know these these things are not very mobile by by virtually any stretch of the word just just re a really immobile platform but if you get them into the right spot and you you have them lined up properly and they're they're actually firing at what you want them to all those conditions met they are an incredibly powerful t2 solution to early t3 or um expensive t2 units i think that's all of my thoughts on that um if anything else comes up i'll, I'll come back to it uh, the next one up is the gremlin this is sort of your spy for your vehicles um, you'll notice that there's kind of these trends between all the different the different uh, uh options here and that's because a lot of the beyond all reason uh units come down to the idea that the unit fulfills rather than like hard counters and, and that sort of thing Anyway, the Gremlin is a cloakable tank. So you can see you can hit cloak and this thing will turn invisible. Uh, I believe you can self-destruct this as well. Uh, we'll test that. We'll test that last. But uh, I, I think you can self-destruct these and, and release the EMP blast. But I don't see the blue circle. So that might not be true. Um, anyway, well, the, the other you know benefit to this is it has a nice uh, line of sight radius. Um, the little orange circle being the uh, the radius for where it will be detected by enemies if an enemy steps within that circle's range. Um, I should have said that about the spy as well, the T2 bot. Uh, same same goes for that. Um, but then you can also tell it to attack. It has an, an it kind of <laughs> unfolds into this little uh, platform, um, and then it shoots out this plasma ball, and it's actually pretty powerful. Like it actually does a a, a nice little chunk of damage. Uh, so we can tell it to stop. It'll stop doing that, and then it'll cloak itself again, and then it's back to being invisible. So, of course, I mean, you can imagine the the implications for this. Like, you sneak it past enemy defenses, put it in their base, unfold it, and then you have a bunch of damage available right in your enemy's base. Uh, very convenient, very nice, and very upsetting to them, I'm sure. Um, now, let's try self-destructing this and see. The spy bot you self-destruct and it releases an EMP blast. It looks like that is not the case for these ones. Okay. Uh, good to know. Even I didn't know that. See, we're all learning things here. Uh, but you you cannot destroy those uh, or self-destruct them for an EMP blast. Now, the last unit up is the Mauser. Um, this is a mobile artillery platform, and it is devastating. I mean, even to T2 stuff, this shell that it fires is just tremendously powerful. It doesn't look like a crazy artillery piece, but let me assure you that if you get four or five of these up and running, they, were, they will tear through T2 vehicles, uh, bots you know whatever it is emplacements whatever it is they will tear to tear through it quickly efficiently and brutally um yeah what a what an outstanding unit i love these things to death i use them in combination with the radars and radar jammers 
Um, I think they're I think they're just a phenomenal unit. And anytime I get the chance to play vehicles, I almost always beeline to this unit because they can just feel downright oppressive if you get enough of these out. Uh, couldn't couldn't speak enough praise about this unit. I really really love it. Um, that being said, you know, its use cases are, of course, just any time you need artillery, right? You want to shell something from far away, the Mauser is a great option for it. Downsides of this unit, uh, it has to be facing the right direction. So its turret has a little bit of swivel to it, as you can see. Um, but the actual vehicle itself has to be facing the right direction in order to fire. Interesting quirk about this is that the vehicle turns faster than the turret. So if you want the turret to fire at something that's like over here, it's actually quicker to turn the vehicle than it is to turn the turret look like the turret turns super slowly so just a point of note um you also can't really retreat with these things because of course they're you know they're going to be uh they're going to be unable to fire because the turret can't turn all the way 180 degrees around um just points to to be aware of anyway that, that concludes the t2 vehicles so we'll take our way back to the main base and we'll start up the next section so next up we have the T1 vehicle, or rather, sorry, the, the next up we have the T1 uh, aircraft plant. Uh, I told you it's a lot of units, and, and bear with me as we get through them all. The T1 aircraft plant, uh, th this is, you know, all the, the T1 air that you're going to be able to produce. Um, the first one, of course, being the Blink, which is your scouting plane. Uh, you can see uh, the radius here for the Blink. You have a huge line of sight radius, and then just outside of that, you also have a radar radius. Um, so the blink is your scouting craft, and it's what you set ahead of, send ahead of bombers if you want to know where your enemy's economy is and what you should be targeting. Um, that being said, they can also be produced in the late game, just as a cheap way to produce vision in an area, vision and radar in an area. Um, I use them like that all the time whenever I have aircraft plants up. Uh, but yeah, so they're, they're just a scout option, uh, no attack or anything. And uh, they're, they're cheap and they're fast and they're light and they have a huge radius of, of vision. So anytime you think you might need vision of an area, the blink might be what you consider. Next up we have the stork, which is an air transport. This is an interesting one. This has some interesting functionality. Um, it can pick up any light uh, vehicle or building. Um, oddly enough, the construction towers are considered light. So I can actually pick up one of these if I just right click on it. And I actually have this construction turret and then say, you know, I need a little more build power over here. I just hit U to unload and click on this area on the ground. It'll find a good spot for it and plop it down. And then, you know, suddenly I have 200 more build power over here next to my hovercraft plant. Say I don't need it there anymore. I can pick it back up again. Go plop it down over here. Um, so that's one use of these transports, but they can carry a whole load of different things. Basically any T1 unit and a few of the other T2 stuff. Um, yeah, kind of a great unit, but, but very specific, right? Like not a general purpose unit. It definitely has its role. Um, they can pick up commanders and move them around, which you'll see sometimes in early games and weird maps where that becomes useful. Uh, but the, you know, that's, that's kind of the, the extent of the role that those fill. So we're going to leave it there. You have your T1 air constructor. Uh, this fills the same role as all the other T1 air construct or all the other T1 constructors, um, except that you can go T2 aircraft with it. Um, if you if you haven't figured out the pattern, all the T1 builder variants can build their respective T2. All of the T2 variants, the T2 builder variants, can build T3. That's that's as simple as it is. Next up, we have the fighter. Um, this is your your standard fighter that you'll mass produce uh, when you're on the T1 stage of life. Uh, the T1 fighter is not much to brag about, but it is definitely better than not having a fighter if you see a fleet of bombers coming in. So I would recommend setting up a big patrol point using your aircraft plant and then produce, and then setting the, the plant on repeat and just building a huge wall of fighters. You might sometimes hear people refer to a fighter screen or a fighter wall. Um, sometimes it'll, it'll be typed out like this. Fig wall or big screen just to save time um, either of those mean the same thing and it's basically just a, a huge amount of fighters all in a big patrol point so that if bombers are trying to get through they get shot down uh, next up we have the gunship now armada has access to very early gunships a t1 light gunship uh, although it is not very great in in damage per second it is interesting because it does mean that you have a way to deal damage to ground units without very much retaliation uh, that being said there is a whole host of things that can bring down these gunships relatively easily from fighters to anti-aircraft 
so you don't see them very often, but they are very maneuverable, as you can see it doing these these sort of Red Bull esque stunts here, flipping and diving and dodging and weaving all around. Uh, and they, you know, they're they're kind of a good option if you're looking for something to mass produce to uh, do a little bit of harassment here and there. Um, generally, though, they're they're more of a defensive tool, at least when they're used uh, effectively. I see them being effectively used as a defensive tool. So I would I would uh, refrain from using these unless you kind of have an idea of what you're doing and, and what or rather rather what you want to do, what you want to accomplish. And, you know, you'll see whether or not it's effective. And, and that's that's something you can learn from. But uh, w let me know, you know, down in the comments. So let me know if you find a good use for these. I, I really don't have anything off the top of my head other than maybe stopping uh, pushes that have broken through with the light units, grunt units, spam units. Um, that's kind of the only thing that comes to mind. Anyways, moving on, uh, we do have the final one, which is the bomber. Now, this one you should be very comfortable with. In fact, you should know the bomber very well. Um, I have several videos on how to do bombing runs. I have, I have videos on how to effectively build T1 bombing runs uh, by sacking your commander and all that good stuff. Check those out, and maybe while you're touring some of those videos, don't forget to subscribe. Uh, the bomber is a very useful unit for harassing enemy economy. Uh, I'm going to sacrifice this facility here, this T3 facility, to show you exactly what I mean. If you take this bomber and you drop the bombs on this uh, this chunk of build turrets right here, you can see with one bomber, I move. Oh well, I guess it's a lot of uh, construction turrets, so it's not going to be super effective, but. Basically, with a single bomber, I'm able to do a tremendous amount of damage to these uh, construction turrets. And with two bombers, I would be able to blow up one of them, and they would all chain react and explode on each other. That's the power of the bomber. It's it's really meant for harassing these early game uh, economies, as well as taking out the build power of your enemies. Um, because, I mean, if you look at it, you know, that's, that's 31,000 metal in build power. Uh, that's a lot, and that's you know it'd be a really bu it'd really be a bummer to to have all that go down the drain. I'd I'd be unable to produce units for quite a while. You can see this whole mesh of damage bringing these down to eight percent with this bombing run. Sometimes you'll get a little lucky and it'll blow it up on its own. Other times you need a second pass, but boom, all those windmills gone. Just two passes with the bomber, or if you just have two bombers, then there you go, you're done. Um, so just to recap, that's the role that I see the bomber fitting into. It's for harassing early T1 eco. Um, it's for taking out uh, defenses on the front line if they're kind of in a in a line. You know, the bomber drops a line of bombs. So if you get it, if you come in from the side and you drop those bombs along the lines of your enemy, uh, it's going to cause a, a nice, very efficient line of damage. Uh, the caveat to the bomber, though, is that it's slow uh, and it costs more than any of the other planes, and you need to scout. That's, that's the final thing, is if you're using the bomber without using it in conjunction with the scout craft, you're not really getting the effectiveness out of your bombers that you really should. Um, and so to that effect, I just say, the, the ratio that I like to go with is two scout craft to five bombers. I, I think usually you can get enough scouting done with two scouts um, for five bombers to be effective. Anyway, moving onwards, we are go st we're stepping up a tier and going into the T2 aircraft. We follow that down over here. Got a huge slew of aircraft over here. Never mind the naval. We'll get into that just next. Uh, the first one, interestingly enough, is the atomic bomber. Um, what an epic unit, really. As soon as one of these things comes on the field, anti-aircraft pops up everywhere. Because you don't see an atomic bomber drop its bomb and think, uh, you know, I can put up anti-aircraft in a few minutes no you you see the atomic bomber and anti-aircraft is the next thing you queue uh, whether it's fighters whether it's ground-based anti-aircraft whatever it is this thing strikes fear into the heart of your enemies and this is why boom and it all goes up in smoke uh, the atomic bomber has a tremendous attack huge amount of damage and you can see it's already recharged for another one these things can dish out a huge amount of damage to the point that they can eliminate players from the game this really this 100 percent can be a, a commander killer uh, if you put it in the right spot and you use it proper properly you scout before you use it um, this thing can change the game that's how important the atomic bomber is it comes at a high cost though 2200 metal 46,000 uh energy 
steep, steep price to pay to keep this bomber online, but uh, it can be well worth it. Uh, if you if you get comfortable with bombing and you know how this thing works and you you have the scouting information, this thing can very, very, very quickly, I mean, in one attack, it can change the entire outcome of a game. We're talking about blowing up aphises. We're talking about taking out commanders. We're talking about destroying an entire front line of T2 units with a single attack. Like the, the options are limitless for this much damage crammed into a single attack mode. Um, and yeah, I, I really have nothing but praise to say for this thing. And God bless you. And, and may he be on your side if you see one of these coming towards your base because your time may be very short on this this uh, metal, metal extractor planet. Anyway, moving on from my uh, my praise for the atomic bomber, uh, we have the Hornet, which is a gunship. Um, now, this is a great option for if you're looking for a way to deal out damage. Um, contrary to the T1 gunship, the light gunship, this fires armor-penetrating missiles um, that are also heat-seeking, slightly. Uh, they, they, they can curve slightly to hit their target, but uh, sometimes they do still miss. Um, it fires a salvo of two of them, and they're armor-piercing, which means that they're good against uh, uh, vehicles, and uh, T3 stuff as well. Um, they just do a lot of damage. Uh, but you can see this thing can like linger in the air, kind of float around, um, and shoot these missiles out. So this is a great way to take down Titans if you if you have a uh, enough of them built up in mass. Uh, any of the big any of the big bulky units, as long as there's not anti air to shoot these things down, um, this can be a great option for taking those out. Uh, I see these as sort of a defensive tool, taking out units that maybe break through defenses, and you need a quick way to get rid of them. Um, the reason for that is, of course, because their fighter wall isn't going to be anywhere near on defense. On offense, you'd have to clear their whole fighter wall to use these. Um, that being said, you can use them on offense. If you build 100, 200 of them, they're, they're going to be uh, more than enough to, to push through and fire enough missiles to blow up you know, one or two targets. But you might consider bombing if you're going to be producing things on that scale because these are quite cost inefficient at 1,250 metal a pop. Next up. We have the EMP bomber. Now, this is very unique to Armada. Armada is very into uh, EMP technology, and their bomber is reminiscent of that. Uh, if we have this thing drop a payload here, we can we can see exactly its bombs in effect. I have a bomb over here. You can see they drop this nice huge cloud of, of EMP missiles. Um, those are actually much more effective than you might think. They can stun up to T3 units with just a single pass. Uh, making it one of the best EMP options available uh, for the Armada faction. Uh, I would I would definitely recommend if you're going T2 and you uh, T2 Air that is, if you're going T2 Air and you either don't plan on spending much time in T2 Air or you're planning on just putting out a few units and then ecoing a little bit more, I would recommend spitting out a few EMP bombers because the value that they can get in the hands of your teammates, just giving them to your teammates uh, or microing them yourself. Uh, can be tremendous. You, you really can can impact a lot of change. You can stop pushes dead in their tracks. Um, extremely, extremely precise defensive tool and a great way to contribute to the ground fight from air. Um, a lot of praise for these bombers. I think uh, if, if there's any unit that you want to get comfortable with, this is definitely one to take a look at. Now, next up, we have the sonar plane, the, the, the radar sonar plane, I guess I should say. Um, this is a upgraded scout vehicle, um, and you can tell just by looking at it just how upgraded it is. Uh, first of all, it can see sonar, so it can see into the ocean and find submarines and other uh, submerged vehicles. We'll get into that in just a minute here when we get into the the, the ocean-based uh, vehicles and or the ocean the ocean boats that you have for Armada. Uh, but it also has a huge radar presence, which you can see is this green line up on the top here, uh, oscillating back and forth as this thing moves. Um, this is a really, really powerful scouting tool. I would, I would probably say that the, the first thing you should do with one of these is just put it near your front line, um, somewhere where you know there's not anti-air, but basically run it along the, fir the front line uh, because it's almost guaranteed to detect something that isn't illuminated by radar uh, and offer your teammates a little bit of insight into the battle that they're fighting. Um, so if you're playing backline and you have T2 and you build one of these, send it up to the front lines because it'll help them a lot more than it'll help you uh, when, when you're scouting. Um, that being said, this is, this is the kind of scout that you would send ahead of a nuclear bomber. Uh, if you wanted to use one of those and you were, you were looking for the right way to scout, this is, this is the way to go. Um, this or about a thousand of those tiny T1 scout craft, uh, either one works. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, next up, we have the transport, the T2 transport, called the Abductor. Kind of a weird name, but uh, I guess it makes sense. This thing does have an attack, actually. It's an EMP attack, and it's like a big laser beam that it shoots. There you go. And you see it kind of, like, scars the ground there because it actually fires for a, a while. Um, it also has, like, a, a slight AoE to it. Uh, so this thing can actually be dragged, like, across a line. So, you know, it'll, it, it can fire in, like, a line of... Uh, of attack so if you manage to get this thing to attack in a in a line of infantry it can stun a whole row of infantry with just a single attack um, but this is also a transport so this can pick up everything that the regular transport couldn't um, namely like some of the heavier buildings can be transported with this thing but also it can pick up multiple t1 uh, vehicles and and bots and whatever else so it can pick up multiple of those um the the load maneuver the yeah the load units what you can do is you can you can left click and you can highlight an area and it'll go pick up everything it can in that area and we'll see it here in just a second as it, it moves over that way um you can you can pick up all these these uh construction turrets or, or vehicles whatever you you happen to want to pick up um and then you can unload them all in an area too by doing the exact same but opposite um and there you can see you can pick up three turrets i guess um, and then if I hit U and I kind of just put an area down right here, it'll try and put them down there. It won't work. So it'll just kind of like find areas around here. Tell it to keep doing that. Keep trying. There you go. Yeah. Looks like it'll only do one at a time. So I guess you can do like a, a repeat command to make sure that it does the, the right thing there. Um, but anyway, that's the, the T2 transport. It fills the same role as the regular transport, just uh, you know a little bit more effective and also has that EMP attack. Um, next up is the T2 constructor. Uh, same goes as all the other T2 constructors. You have all your T2 uh, factories and, and plants and all that sort of stuff. Um, this has the added benefit of flying, though. So these are often used for building the SimCity with advanced fusion reactors and energy converters, all that sort of stuff, just for the fact that they don't get tangled up in the mess of construction to try and, you know, weasel in and out of all the different spaces for all the buildings. Um, that's the only ex exceptional note that I have for these that, that stands out for all the T2 constructors. Next up, you have the High Wind, which is the Stealth Fighter. Um, this is a much better option for a fighter. It's the best fighter you can get because it's the highest tier of a fighter in the game. Um, and, you know, for what you pay for, it's really good. It, it can take a few shots from T1 aircraft, and it'll take down T1 aircraft in one shot, I believe. Um, so a, a step up from T1 aircraft for sure. Definitely, you know, 10 of these will beat 50 T1 aircraft. Maybe that's an over-exaggeration, but, you know, t 10 of these is a lot more effective than 20 T1 aircraft for sure. Um definitely worth transitioning into these ones as soon as you can uh, they are a bit more expensive though so you know un understandable if you don't transition right away but eventually you do want to get into these t2 fighters because they're really you know it, it, it's like you might as well have the best fighter screen that you can because uh, your teammate that has 40 bombers coming towards their base is going to be a lot more grateful for having a t2 air screen that actually stops it than a t1 air screen that only stops about half of them uh, anyway moving on to the the gunship um, over here the, the gunship is like the... It's sort of in between this other gunship. You have two gunships here, I should say. Um, this is the Roughneck, which is just called the gunship. Uh, this fires a plasma blast. If we Let's bring it over here and have it fire at this spot so we can sort of see these in comparison. Um, this is another gunship option and sort of a lot better for, I guess, if you're dealing with like lighter T1 units or something like that. Uh, you can see it fires this like this sort of gauss cannon thing um i i'm not sure like where the exact line between these two is like why you would build one over the other except i guess that this is a lot cheaper right like you're paying 310 metal for this versus 1250 metal for for the hornet so you could build three of these roughnecks for the same cost as a single hornet and, you know, you don't get that tracking, you don't get that armor piercing, but if you're just using these to stop, like, a few T1 units that are running by here and there, like, uh, you know, the difference might be worth saving the money on. Um, and, you know, that's something for you to individually consider as you're, as you're playing, but that's, uh, that's the other gunship that you have available in the T2 stage. And the last two are bombers, the first of which being a torpedo bomber, um, which is interesting because it has a sonar vision range, which is the, uh, the blue line here. 
Um, and that means that it can attack boats. So what it does is when you, when you attack something in the ocean, it drops these torpedoes and then they track to whatever the target is. Uh, these are very, very important for naval warfare. Um, if you have an air player and you're playing Navy, you should definitely ask them to be making a few of these for you or using a few of these. They are, um, almost, almost necessary for naval warfare because they are a really great option for dealing a ton of damage to via or to, uh, to boats without, you know, having, having to actually be there in the presence of the boat. Um, that being said, of course, if there's aircraft out, uh, anti-aircraft out, you're you're gonna have to switch away from these and and find a different solution to your problem there. But early on, these can drop, uh, you know, four or five of these can drop enough torpedoes to bring down a lot of T2 ships. And the uh, the idea behind that being that you can drop those torpedoes in the water and then they track your enemy. So that bombers don't actually have to fly over the enemy. You just drop the torpedoes in the water and then fly away. And the torpedoes will chase after the enemy. Um, sort of an interesting bomber for that. For the, you know, the, the uh, tracking aspect of that. But they are an interesting one nonetheless. And I would definitely recommend getting used to those if you're Navy or if you're uh, Air and you're playing with somebody who's playing Navy. I would de definitely recommend you make a few of these and support your, your Naval buddy. They will definitely be thankful for it. Uh, the final bomber and the final T2 aircraft is the strategic bomber, which drops impulse warheads, which is just a fancy way of saying that they're extremely powerful. Um, you can see the bombs that this thing drops. Tremendously huge explosion. Um, and, you know, their damage corresponds with that. They, they do a ton of damage and they have a lot of health. They're definitely just a more powerful bomber overall. Um, interestingly, I noticed that it costs 230 metal, which is... I guess it's a little more than double the cost of, uh, or a little less than double the cost of a, a regular T1 bomber. For what you get out of this, I really feel like it's a lot more than double the uh, the efficiency with, with how powerful these bombs are. Um, four or five of these is enough to blow up a single APHIS. Uh, so, you know, if you're looking for bombing and, and you know, you need some way to bomb the enemy, um, this, is, this is what you're aiming for, right? The other thing you might notice is that these bombs are a lot more clustered. So they're a lot closer together. Uh, so you can you can bomb more specific areas uh, without having to worry about your bombs being thrown wherever you you don't want them. Uh, but yeah, and that's you know that's kind of the role that that fills. Uh, so moving on, we are going to move on to Navy. Uh, this is the next section. We're going to skip T three for now, and we're going to go straight to Navy. Uh, now T one Navy, we've got grouped up over here, starting with the submarine. Um, this is another case of the, uh, under, uh, a new symbol popping up for Navy specifically. Um, and you can see it's a little blue cross. Now the blue means that it is a underwater attacker. So it can, it, it can attack anything that is submerged. The Hornet is being attacked. Oh, these must have, must have crossed each other at some point and, and accidentally attacked. Let me, uh, stop that for just a second. Okay. Back to Navy. Uh, the, the eel, the submarine shoots a torpedo. Um, and this can attack anything that floats in the water, so boats, um, or swims through the water, aka submarines. It can also attack things that are walking across the ocean floor. Um, any sort of the amphibious vehicles or bots, excuse me, or anything else, uh, this the submarine can attack with its torpedo. Um, so a good option for that if you're if you you know need some sort of underwater attack. Um, you're going to be looking for this blue cross again in the top left hand corner of the the unit uh, the unit card I guess I would call it. Uh, next up is the skater. Um, you can see this has a purple purple triangle. Um, it means it's an anti aircraft. It does also have a light um, laser uh, close quarters laser is what it's called uh, what it, like technically called. Um, but you can see it's these two little little uh, laser blasts here um, that it shoots out of its front uh, this is a this is a scout craft um, similar to the tick similar to the rover just a very very light scout craft um, it has sonar vision so it can see submarines if they're nearby um, good for harassment uh, also decent option for anti-air although you need a lot of them that's that's something to keep in mind is that if you want these for anti-air you're gonna need five or ten of them to be a really effective anti-air force uh, just because they, their anti-air attack is so weak. 
Um, but when you're going Navy, you know, these are these are a good one to mix in uh, here and there just to make sure that torpedo bombers or something like that aren't uh, killing your units indefinitely. You know, you have some way to deal with them. Um, you just need to make sure that you have enough because torpedo bombers, of course, can attack these and they'll take them out with a single a single volley of torpedoes. Moving on, we have the Elsa. This is sort of the generalized ship, um, although it doesn't fulfill a generalized role. So take that with a grain of salt. It has two Gauss cannons, uh, or plasma cannons, I should say, uh, and it just it, it can fire both of these at the same time uh, off of its you know its its port side. Um, and you'll notice that it cannot fire. Well, I guess it can't fire both of them up there. Anyway. Um, these these cannons fire and they do damage like it's the most straightforward straightforward unit you're going to get here it's just raw dps that you can incorporate into your fleet in order to damage enemy boats um it's not complicated it's it's just uh gauss cannons it's just it's just plasma cannons uh next up we have the destroyer now this feels a bit of a more complex role this is this is more of a like all-around unit to build um Keep in mind that the, the T1 destroyer and the T2 destroyer are very different. We'll get into those differences when we get to T2. Uh, but the T1 destroyer is a uh, depth charge launcher, which means that it can shoot underwater. It drops these little these little uh, mines you can see there that track underwater, um, and it also has a huge plasma cannon on top as well. So this is a this is an all around vehicle. It's good for uh, well, I guess I should call it a ship. Uh, it's good for uh, naval to submerged warfare it's good for naval to naval warfare um, it's just not good against naval to air warfare so you have to make sure that you support this with the appropriate anti-aircraft ships um, i usually support these with a contingent of submarines as well because the depth charge launcher is very good but submarines will destroy these uh, if they have enough time because it can only fire so many depth charges and uh, submarines torpedoes do a lot of damage to boats uh, that being said, you know, you kind of build your fleet around these things. So you kind of incorporate LCAs if you need more damage above the water, submarines if you need damage below the water, um, and more destroyers is always a good option to just build a bunch of them. Uh, next up, we have the constructor ship, very similar to the other T1 constructors. This is how you step into T2. It's also how you step into the amphibious complex. Um, there's also the seaplanes, which I've covered in a different video, so I'm actually not going to cover them here. Um, but be aware that the seaplanes exist. They're just a bit too specialized. Um, I, maybe I should cover them, but there's there's other tutorials out there, and I've got to show my content somehow. So if you're looking for seaplanes, check out my other video on that. Um, otherwise, we're going to keep going on. Uh, the T T1 uh, naval constructor can build T1 defense. You see this blue check, so you know this can attack underwater. Um, it can build these laser turrets, which are an above-water attack. It can build these shark's teeth, which are... Uh, a fortification that goes above the water won't stop submarines which is important to know um and it can also be these naval hovercraft platforms which are the same as hovercraft uh just you know you need to be uh you, you need to build them in water so you build one of these instead um but yeah mo moving along we have the grim reaper which is a resurrection submarine um filling the same role as the lazarus for the uh the bot lab uh it can reclaim stuff so it should really be called a reclaim resurrection um repair submarine but <laughs> i guess the naming convention wasn't solidified anyway uh this thing will reclaim anything uh, if you need to it can repair wrecks um, it can refloat boats that have sunk to the bottom of the ocean um and it can it can uh, uh did i cover all three i guess that's it. It, it it's a it's a very simple craft it fills very three very simple roles um, but very necessary because all of these boats are very expensive in metal um, so you definitely need one of these out there collecting the metal, sending it back to you so that you're not uh, at a metal deficit compared to your enemy. Um, definitely an interesting part of naval warfare that you have to be aware of. And the final T1 naval unit is the Dolphin. Now the Dolphin is a uh, is a uh, assault unit, I guess you would call it. It's It's got these two twin guns that uh, they can fire in, in succession as long as you're firing off the port bow. So alignment for these ones matters a lot. Um, but you can see they fire this rapid fire Gauss cannon, uh, which is you know close close quarters plasma turret. I don't know they they switch between plasma and Gauss um, in definition. But anyway, uh, this thing is your early harassment vehicle. It's slightly better than the Skater. It's got a little more health, a little more damage per second, um, and costs a little bit more. Not a lot more though. So 
if you're if you're looking to harass and you're deciding between the skater and the dolphin, go with the dolphin. If you're looking for anti-air and scouting and sonar um, and you're deciding between the dolphin and the skater, that's when you would go with the skater. Uh, but that's really the only important note I have for that, just making that decision between those two. Um, and other than that, you know, you're, you're, you're in good shape if you're mixing in all these units together. Uh, now we're going to jump to T2 Naval. Um, and if we follow this trail back this way past our friendly ships, we get to the big array of T2 Naval stuff. So we'll start with the submarines. Uh, the first one being the Barracuda, which is a fast assault submarine. Um, it has a quick turnaround radius, or a quick a quick turning radius, I guess it's, I should say. Uh, it has a torpedo attack, so it can attack underwater, um, and it can attack boats. Um, and it's sort of the default sub, uh, submarine, you know, underwater vehicle that you're that you're going to want to go with um, if you're you know you're looking for something to to build for your T2 army. Um, the next one is the Serpent, which is a long-range battle submarine. So this is a little bit more of a niche role that it fills, but basically it's like a artillery piece, but underwater. Um, so this thing launches a torpedo uh, a great distance, and it's a homing torpedo too. And you can see it, it kind of fires this like wimpy-looking little torpedo. Well, as it turns out, that torpedo actually does 1,650 damage, which is like hilariously high like a huge amount of damage um just from you know what looks like this like wimpy little regular torpedo uh i'm i'm a fan of of the, the idea of increasing this torpedo somehow like visually just making it look a little more dangerous um but other than that you know this this is a good thing to note that this is like a siege weapon that you would build and you you, know, you usually don't spam these you'd usually spam the barracudas um the serpent is more of like a precision instrument of war Next up, we have the Dragon Slayer anti-airship. Um, if you're looking for anti-air and you know you're unsatisfied with the skater, uh, it's probably time to go for a Dragon Slayer. This has a flat cannon as well as some missiles attached to it, and that's all it's dedicated to is shooting down planes. There is a bit of a weird um, stepping stone between T1 naval air and T2 naval air, where the T2 naval air is rather expensive, a thousand metal for the T2 naval air, but it's extremely good. Uh, whereas the T1 naval air is extremely cheap, but extremely bad. So it's kind of a weird balance where you have to go from making like a, a million T1 naval anti-air uh, to making just a few T2 naval anti-air, which is nice, but the price doesn't change, uh, if you if you understand what I'm saying. So a bit of a weird stepping stone there, but other than that, you know, not a not a problem per se, just something to be aware of. Uh, anyways, if, if uh, aircraft are harassing any of your boats, uh, this is the vehicle you're looking for. The, the ship that you're looking for uh, next up we have the anti-aircraft or the sorry the the aircraft carrier anti-nuke uh, what this has is two aircraft repair platforms which are extremely unutilized in beyond all reason at least in the uh the player versus player scene um and for good reason it's not extremely useful because a lot of aircraft will just get overkilled um there's there's very little chance for repair short of the dragons from cortex uh, but the much more important usage for this is as a, a anti-nuke. So anywhere within this uh, nice big yellow radius, uh, nuclear bombs will be stopped. Um, nuclear nuclear missiles will be shot down. Uh, this is important for protecting your fleets because naval vessels in particular are susceptible to nuclear bombs because they're just, you know, they travel these big straits of water and they're not particularly fast. So um, oftentimes that's a strategy to clear these these. Uh, naval fleets and it's important to be prepared for that next up we have our anti-radar ship uh this does exactly what you think it does it it jams the whole area outlined in red here uh, and and you know masks everything in there from radar presence which is tremendously useful for laying siege to things and keeping your movements hidden uh, after that we have the dreadnought which is a battleship um, and this is where i said that the battleship from t1 and t2 are different the T1 battleship can attack underwater, whereas the T2 battleship cannot. So uh, be aware of that difference when you're when you're dealing with these, because they're named the same thing, but they don't actually perform the same role. Uh, the T2 battleship is just damage, so it performs the same task as the Elsa, which is the, I believe it's called a Corsair. We'll just jump back to T1 really quickly. The Assault Frigate. So the Assault Frigate and the Dreadnought serve uh, similar, similar roles. Um, just as far as functionality goes, but they're not classified the same way. So, so just be, be prepared for that. 
as far as what it does, well, I'll show you. It does a lot of damage. Two huge Gauss cannons, uh, plasma cannons, shooting shooting their massive shells um, and doing a ton of damage. That's, that's what they do. And if you need damage mixed in to your T2 army, uh, this is a great option to do so. Now, I know everyone's looking at it. Let's talk about it. The Epoch, the flagship. Uh, this is an epic vehicle. This is basically a T3 vehicle. I think it's T2 only because they didn't want to include a T3 uh, uh, naval plant. Um, but if they did, this is where it belongs. If I hit A here and look at the range, you can see this thing has a tremendous range. Um, and indeed, it has these huge plasma cannons that can shell away at things from miles and miles. Uh, this is this is the, the, the mother of all siege weapons, um, certainly designed to put fear in the hearts of enemies that are far, far away, um, as well as uh, deal out a ton of damage to anything that comes in close. Uh, as you can see, these uh, other batteries on the side can also put out plasma shots and just wreak havoc to anything that comes nearby the ship. Uh, as if that wasn't enough, it also features two anti-aircraft missile launchers, so it can shoot down any uh, planes that try to harass it. Just the all-in-one package, except you'll notice it has no submarine attack. So it is extremely weak to submarine attacks. Uh, so you need to support this with a, uh, a contingent of submarines and uh, you know maybe some battle submarines uh, as well as some aircraft. Because it's if, if somebody's going to bomb one of these with aircraft, they're going to bomb it hard and they're going to bomb it fast. And you need more than just the aircraft on board. Um, you would probably like some flak vehicle or some flak ships uh, riding alongside this this here uh, epoch. The, the supreme battleship um but yeah that's you know you it probably comes right to mind exactly what you'd want to use this for um it becomes obvious when you're in a game you you use this thing to attack <laughs> you send it down river and it starts firing uh and that's really all there is it, there's there's a beauty in its simplicity now moving along we do have the t2 naval constructor uh, we'll talk about this a little more in depth because there's actually a few interesting things here um, the first being the Gorgon, which is a, a rapid fire plasma tower, um, which is interesting because it, it is exactly what it sounds like. It, it fires a spew of plasma balls um, towards anything above water. There is the Naval Arbalist, which is an anti-aircraft turret. Um, and you can also build the Experimental Amphibious Gantry, uh, which is kind of cool. It allows you to build T3 units underwater, um, any, of the, any of the amphibious T3 units. You can also build naval fusion reactors as well as naval energy converters, which are actually more efficient than the land-based versions, oddly enough. Um, so if you have the chance to get into a T2 underwater economy, I would definitely recommend it because it is actually a lot more efficient than the T1 stuff on land. Anyway, uh, we also have the naval engineer. Um, this is a lot closer to the vehicle uh, supporter craft than the, uh, the bot one. You can see it can build a whole host of different things, um, including construction turrets, which are really important. Uh, it can also build plasma artillery on land if you can get it close enough. Uh, it can build platypus for harassing land if you want to build a bunch of those in the water and then send them on land. Uh, it can also build a whole host of defenses and, and other turrets and such, uh, as, as well as T1 constructors. So you can you can also go into the, all the, the necessary T1 stuff, but definitely a useful one to tag along with your t2 constructors in case you want a bunch of build power attached to them but also in case you want to just build some harassment vehicles or other you know random random stuff that the t2 constructor cannot build now the paladin this is an important vehicle uh an important ship i should say uh, this has two depth charge launchers on it so it's extremely powerful against uh submarines uh, any you know any of those vessels any underwater vessels uh, and it also has a, a Gauss cannon, a long-range Gauss cannon on, on its head. So this is sort of your all-around vehicle, right? This is your this is your everything but air, like everything that swims through the sea, this thing can attack. And that's really important because if you're building a contingent of ships, you know, you're building a fleet, uh, one might call it, you're going to want something that can really just be like all-around really, really strong against everything. Um, and that's where the Paladin comes in. So a lot of my mixtures of units consist of paladins uh, barracudas and dragon slayers I, I think that's a really powerful combination you you kind of get the best of all the worlds of attack you cover all your bases and then eventually you start mixing in 
dreadnoughts, you start mixing in epochs, you start mixing in messengers, uh, or longbows rather. Uh, you, you sort of build up this fleet, right? And I, I kind of think of it as building up around the cruiser, um, just because it sort of can just do everything well. Uh, anyway, the last boat that we're going to talk about is the longbow, and this is a missile cruiser and probably one of my favorite ships in the game. This is a harassment vehicle. Uh, it is, is an artillery uh, siege engine, and you can see if I attack this area over here, it opens up and fires this beautiful missile, uh, at the apex of which... It falls down, boom, and splits into a bunch of different little pellets that sort of pepper the ground. Uh, I love that. I think that's such a beautiful design. I, I love the idea behind that. I, I just love everything about that. Um, and as well as its its massive range allows you to clear out T1 defenses with relative ease uh, and eventually contest anything up to T2 um, if, if you need to lay siege to those bases. Uh, that's that's its role that it fits in and it performs it extremely well now that concludes our navy adventure let's briefly take a look at hovercraft before we get into t3 so this is the hovercraft section and it'll be short simple and sweet first hovercraft you have is the sweeper uh, the sweeper is an anti-aircraft hovercraft uh, boy try saying that three times fast uh, I can't demonstrate its attack to you, but it shoots three little missiles up into the air, um, and and sure enough, it sweeps aircraft out of the air. Uh, I don't have a lot of notes about this thing. It performs very well. Uh, in fact, I like all of the hovercraft, and if they weren't so expensive, I would use them more often. Uh, the sweeper is pretty good anti-air. It, it strikes down fighters. Um, it strikes down light anti-aircraft. I think it takes two volleys to kill a bomber, which is which is exceptional. I'm talking too fast here. Just so excited. Love Armada. Um, not, not such a fan of Cortex, but we will get there and there will be a video covering them as well. Uh, but the, the sweeper is a great option for aircraft in any you know area that you need it. You can also see it has a huge radius, so you don't need very many of these to cover a, a wide area from scout craft. And then you don't you, you need even less of them than bots to cut to protect from bombers or you know cover yourself from, from that sort of attack. Moving on, we have the crocodile, which is the hover tank. Um, kind of, this is probably my least favorite of all the units, ironically. Uh, I think it's got a cool name, but aside from that, it's sort of basic. It just fires a, a uh, plasma shot, um, does a little bit of damage, does uh, have a good amount of health. You know, it's it's kind of just an all-around uh, tanky, uh, beefy damage per second unit. And uh, if you build a bunch of them, they're, they're great for harassing bases or whatnot, you know, moving from from water to land. It's These are sort of your other option for if you want to transition from naval supremacy to land supremacy. Um, I prefer the amphibious tanks, but, you know, this is the other way to go. Um, just be aware that it's a bit more expensive of a way to go. All of these are more expensive than the T1 vehicles, uh, just because you're paying for the ability to float along the water. Um, now, next up, we have the Possum, the Hovercraft Rocket Launcher. Now, this is the easiest way to get into rockets early on in the game. And indeed, it can actually be a huge advantage. You can see this thing has a massive radius, and it's because this shoots a, well, not a huge rocket, but early on in, in T1, this can be a, a devastating attack. Uh, with just three of these, you can burst down light laser turrets with a single attack. Um, and you can see it attacks pretty quickly, too. So, you you know, you really can siege stuff pretty effectively with these things. If I'm going hovercraft, usually what I'll do is actually just send a few of these to my front lines. You know, any of my guys at my front lines, I'll just build a few of these, send them up there. I've yet to receive a complaint. I think all of them enjoy the, these hovercraft, enjoy putting them in annoying spots for the enemy to deal with. And I, I, I think it's a tremendous idea. Um, so keep that in mind if you're ever playing hovercraft that your, your front lines would greatly appreciate getting a few of these rocket launchers because uh, it's, a, it's a very early way to get into that and harass the enemy to death. Now moving along, we do have the Tech 1 Constructors. Um, interestingly, this has the option to go into two different Tech 2 routes, being the Tech 2 Vehicle Plant or the Tech 2 Advanced Shipyard. Um, both of which are, you know, equally interesting. This this is essentially just a hybrid between the Tech 1 Naval Constructor and the Tech 1 Vehicle Constructor. It, can, it, it basically is like a, you know, you took both of those and smushed them together. This is what you get. Um, so to that effect, I don't really have any notes on this. Uh, just, you know, whatever whatever either of those can do, it can do both of them. Um, not, not an exceptional amount of build power, not very fast, 
uh, but can traverse all terrain. So that's the benefit you get from it. Now the last unit, the last unit, the last hovercraft unit, um, actually ends up being one of my favorite. This is called the Seeker, and it is a tremendous little unit. It is actually one of the fastest scout units available in the game. Um, it is one of the most expensive scout units as well, but I, I think its price is actually justified. Uh, it zooms around on this little hovercraft base, and it has a little laser attack that it can shoot. Pew, pew, pew. Um, these can actually be really devastating to early game T1 economic. Whoa, T1 economies. I almost said eco economies. <laughs> this can be really devastating to T1 economies because uh, just a few blasts from this thing can take down metal extractors um, as well as solar panels and windmills. So using these things to harass is a really, really good strategy, um, especially early game. You know, there, if, if you've watched my other videos, which I know all of you watch every single video, of course, <laughs> uh, if you watched any of those videos, you know that... Uh, I, I use them extensively in my Supreme Straits strategy to harass my naval competitor and and keep them from getting the expansion uh, that I that I want you know that I want to expand to. Uh, so to that effect, I, I think they're an excellent unit, excellent choice of unit if you're looking for something to harass early with. Um, does the cost of going for hovercraft justify just this unit? I don't think so. Um, but if you're going hovercraft, it is a wonderful added benefit that this unit is so damn good. Now, that is the end of the hovercraft and the end of our armada. Oh, wait, we're forgetting one. The T3, of course. How could we forget? The T3 units are amazing, as they should be. I mean, these are the end of the game units, and there's a lot to talk about here. Uh, we're going to start with the biggest, baddest boy, um, sorry, Thor, you're going to have to wait because we've got competition. We've got a Stompa. If you're a fan of orcs and Warhammer 40k, this is probably what you imagine a lot of the orc uh, mechs look like, a lot of the, the orc gargants. Um, this is the Titan, and it's got a whole host of badass attachments. First of all, it's got its impulse blasters on its arm. Pew, pew. You can see those firing away there. It's also got its long-range laser of doom, which I'm not, uh, you know, I didn't come up with that. That's its actual name. Um, and that does a tremendous amount of damage that can burst down towers units you name it it just it's damage per second and it's a lot of it uh, it also has its missile launcher so it can fire these huge missiles wherever you want um, they come out of that little tube there you can't actually excuse me you can't actually make it fire that missile launcher or at least I don't know how but uh, you'll, you'll just have to take my word for it that they come out and they're a great thing for sieging through uh, plasma shields that sort of thing that deflect uh, the the regular plasma blasts that come out of its its hands. Um, aside from that, I mean, tremendous amount of health, huge DPS. It 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 crushes units that it steps on. Um, I mean, what an epic unit, right? Like as many of these as you can get on the battlefield, I'll take them because they are awesome. Uh, that being said, most expensive unit in the game, or well, I shouldn't say that. Most expensive armada unit that you can build. Uh, but the 13,500 metal price tag on it is uh, nothing to scoff at. So getting these out is a feat, but once you have them, boy, you're going to be happy to use it because they are powerful uh, as all hell. Next up, we have the Lunkhead, which is the heavy, heavy hovercraft, an excellent unit for contesting uh, a, a heavily bunkered Navy because a lot of the time the Navy will be relying on torpedoes and torpedoes cannot attack hovercraft interestingly enough um, i mean it makes sense right torpedoes can only stay in the water and hovercraft don't touch the water so the lung cat is a good option for that um, you can see it's also in that direction because it has a depth charge launcher that it can shoot so it can actually target submarines and you know all that stuff uh, as well as shoot its big above ground cannon which i'll show you here which is these like big impulse warheads um, the same ones that the bomber drops actually i believe yeah it looks very similar um, anyway, it shoots these warheads out uh, out of these little cannons, which I, I kind of feel like aren't the right size for those shells, but we'll just ignore that casually. <laughs> uh, but yeah, these, these things are a great option for if you're looking to damage a naval player or if you have a route to sneak around a player and you need to pop up in their base through a naval route that they didn't have protected, um, definitely take a look at the Lunkhead. Next up, we have the Marauder, another amphibious unit, although the Lunkhead isn't amphibious, but it is... Uh, you, you know, it can't traverse water. 
Uh, anyway, the Marauder's Amphibious uh, Assault Mech. Although, I wouldn't really call it an Assault Mech. I would really call it a Raider Bot. It has these huge Gauss cannons up on its shoulders, I guess you would call it. Um, and they fire this sort of rapid-fire Gauss projectile. Um, and I love to use these for raiding. They're, you can, I mean, you can see how quick it is right there, just moving along. Um, they can go into the water as well, which I'll show you here. And when they traverse in the water, they're actually even faster. Their guns kind of fold back into, like, propellers, and they, they zip along underwater um, at great speed. Now, these are great because you can send them underwater, you know, past and, and, and flank your enemies. But then as soon as they pop out, they've got this super fast Gauss attack that they do that is just devastating. Um, two or three of these can tear down a base in seconds. Uh, definitely, you know, killing a uh, advanced fusions, APHIS, um, killing metal extractors, killing energy converters, you name it. They're going to be able to do it. Uh, definitely one of my favorite T3 units. Coming up right after that is the Razorback. Now, this is a cool unit. Just, I mean, from the unit design all the way to the unit's attack. I mean, look at that. Look at the design of that thing. Um even more devastating is its weaponry. You can see it fires these double laser Gatling cannons. What an awesome unit. And you can even see its barrels heating up as it fires, which is just such a neat little touch to this thing. Um, I love this unit. I really think these are probably one of my favorite units in the entire game. Um, a great assault mech. This this is a battle mech. This, this is named perfectly. No contention here. This is exactly what it says it is. This thing is made for battle, and it just devastates everything. Like, you, you get a couple of these out, you can contest Titans. You have one or two of them out, you can contest T2 vehicles. Like, they're just made to fight, and they fight dirty, and they fight hard. And, you know, I, I don't have much more to say about that. They're just a really good frontline unit. Um, they'll push through basically everything short of T3 defense. Now, up next is your artillery option. These are called the Vanguard, and they're really interesting. Um, they have a low trajectory and a high trajectory setting. I'll show you a few shots on the low trajectory and then talk about it, and we'll switch to high trajectory. Um, you can see they have a huge effective radius, so these are these are meant to siege bases that are fortified, bunkered up really tightly. Um, they're also all-terrain, so they can climb up on mountains, they can climb on cliff sides, and generally just get themselves into really weird positions that your enemy might not be expecting. Um, that's typically how I like to think of them, is like if my enemy is you know has plasma shields or deflectors or whatever to... Uh, protect the front of their base well there's a mountain range on the left i'll just put these on top of that and then they can shell down from above um speaking of shelling down from above oh i'm sorry about that you might have just heard me bump the microphone there i'm just too excited you can see you put it in high trajectory and it sticks its nose way up in the air and lobs this projectile way up in the air super super high and you know before it even comes down it'll probably fire another one yeah it comes down and it does a huge amount of damage um, I believe it like does a little bit more damage when you fire it up in the air, but I could be wrong about that. Um, either way, that's for if you you know you're on one side of a mountain and you need to clear it to attack the other. There you go. That'll that'll clear a mountain um, for sure. Look at that. You can send two attacks at the same time. It's kind of cool. Um, but yeah, that that's your vanguard and that's a, a really wonderful siege option, um, pushing back front lines, sieging bases from weird angles. You name it. That's that's what the vanguard's good at. Now the Thor is the final and arguably the, the second closest to the Titan um, uh, T3 unit that we're going to talk about today. It has a whole host of armaments. Um, the first one, of course, being its Lightning Blast, which it shoots this huge bolt of lightning that chains to different enemies, very similar to the Welder, the T2 Armada bot. Um, if you you know if you have a bunch of T1 units, they just disappear. Uh, it just it just sends them to the shadow realm for sure, and you you no longer have a T1 bot problem. Um, it chains between all of them and destroys them. Uh, it melts down T3 units as well. Very very high damage um, burst that it's doing there. I you know it, it it just is what it is. It's a tank. It has a ton of health. It has a crazy good attack. And for added bonus, if you hit D, you pull up the missile launcher. That's right, the missile launcher. This thing can shoot missiles out of these side salvos here. Yeah. Look at that. EMP missile comes down, stuns this for 11 seconds. Enough time, surely, for this thing to come in and destroy, you know, whatever. Shoot another missile out here. Yeah, this is this is like my favorite part about this unit. And unfortunately, probably the most underutilized. I, I really rarely ever see people using that part of the, the Thor. And I think that's a shame because if there's like tachyon accelerators, the, the Armada... Um, t3 defensive structure those will burn down these tanks pretty quickly but 
you have a, a very nice solution to that, which is just to EMP it and get in there and, and blow it up. And, uh, you know, I, it's kind of a shame that I, I see that underutilized so often. Um, but anyway, that's, that's the final T3 unit. And indeed, that's the final unit that we're going to be covering today. If, uh, if, you know, if you like this video, feel free to give it a like. You know, I, I appreciate that. Um, I know we didn't cover the uh, seaplanes. Um, I, that, that was a conscious decision. And uh, I, think it's, uh, I think it's fair to leave those out because they're so specialized. But if you enjoyed this, uh, you know, I, I would really appreciate if you consider subscribing. Uh, but also, more importantly, check out some of the other videos I make. Because, you know, I put a, put a lot of care into those. And if you're new and this is a video that's getting you into bar, you'll probably find those other ones useful as well. Uh, anyway, that being said, thanks for watching. This has been the cumulative summary of all the Armada units, all the Armada tools, everything that you have at your disposal as an Armada player. And thank you very much for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Have a great day.